Today on Rambling About Cars, it's all about automotive design. Pre-war, post-war, jet age, malaise, modern retro, fins, fenders, wedges, jelly bean, bangle butt, spindle grill. We hash it all out, the best and the worst, and of course we have to have a cheap car challenge for cars from our favorite design era, and we have a special guest to help get through the madness. So without further ado, it's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith, and you know Mr. Chris Bruce across the way. I'm right here, and our guest today is our new boss and also our old boss, uh, <laughs> Seth Mearsma. And Seth, Seth, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. And as a uh, as a new guest to Rambling About Cars, you have to take the quiz, and we haven't had a new guest in a while, so this will be fun. Very so, exciting. Um, I'll kick things off, and then, Smith, you can take the next question. So, All right. Seth, what is your favorite car of the 1980s? Ooh, my favorite car of the 1980s. Um, I mean, it could be it could be an Ur Quattro. It could it's probably some sort of rally car. Honestly, I think that's my. Okay. I'll, I'll, even though I'm not a big a big racing guy, I think that the the uh, the the rally cars uh, from that sort of pinnacle of the sport are really exciting. And so the road going stuff off of there is has always been. Uh, 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 poster fodder, let's say. <laughs> okay. You're, you're not wrong. I, I am a rally fan and yeah. um, 80s killer bees. Um, yeah, yeah, should yeah. also should also mention there are no wrong answers here. So of course just, not. Just just go with like stream of consciousness. The world will judge you internally. We probably will. Well, I mean, I've also <laughs> got to throw I've got to throw one other one out there at least because it's something right. I, I'm something that I've written about a lot and something that like I've personally owned and and you guys know very well. But uh, the Pontiac Fiero, like the original yes. Pontiac Fiero has a very, very dear, uh, near and dear spot in my heart. Uh, it's a car that I grew up sort of riding in and uh, my mom still owns one. She gave it to me for a little while. I gave it back to her. Uh, so um, it's it's a extremely flawed car and one that I have a lot of challenges with, but I still I still love it and will always love it. So flaws equal character. That's, that's right. Exactly. Speaking of flaws and character, then what's your favorite car from the 70s? 70s. So this was almost my answer. The 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 answer on the tip of my tongue for the for the 80s was the Lancia Strato, Stratos, which is one of my favorite cars of all time, period. Right. And I was I'm I'm sort of wondering I, it's a 70s car, not really an 80s car. So yes. Um you know, wedge design, louvered rear windows, amazing uh, motorsports history. It's a weirdo car too. Everybody who's ever driven one has talked about it being like one of the most difficult cars to drive really, really well and incredibly satisfying. So, um, so yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Stratos. Final answer okay. on that one. Okay. okay, that's fine. Bruce, you got the next one. Yeah. So it's been a while since we've done this. Favorite car of the '90s? Is that the next one? Right. I mean, we can we can do that. We have like okay. ten questions that we pick and choose from. Favorite okay, let's do favorite car of the 90s, and then you do the last one, and we'll move on forward. Favorite car of the 90s is a little bit tougher because, let's see, there are just so many, right? Like, oh, okay. uh, I mean, you know, that's I grew up in the 90s, really. I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I, was a, I was a teenager in the 90s, so those are the cars that I kind of, like, grew up with and loved and really, like, started my enthusiasm for, so it's kind of hard to answer. I'll go, like, my stock answer for this is always a, a twin-turbo Supra. Right, the, okay. the the top line Toyota Supra. A buddy of mine, Todd Norman. Todd, hello, come on the podcast if you're listening. Uh, yes, had his his you're dad welcome. had one growing up, and it was always sort of uh, we were always pushing him to steal the car. Basically, nobody was allowed <laughs> to drive the car, and we were always pushing him to steal the car, uh, which would have been a really really bad idea at the time. But um, yeah. but it would have been epic up until that point. Amazing. Yes, it would have been. Yeah, I, I think of it now, like like a. A dummy 16 year old kid trying to drive uh you know then one of the most potent cars that you could buy certainly out of japan uh around western michigan probably not a great idea but uh yeah i've, I've always really loved that car as a result okay we'll go with that well let's do two more um okay. and since you are based in uh, in michigan this is be mm -hmm. this is a very poignant one you have a choice heated steering wheel heated seats oh only heated one seats. heated no seats no question. I get gloves, man. Just you, wear gloves. You'd be surprised how, I mean, that's like a 50, 50 question we've had with guests. It's really? starting to lean way more towards heated seats. Like in the early on, it, there was a lot of heated steering wheel Clint. There were some other ones, but now the heated seat ones are starting to win. Well, yeah, it's, it's they January. Cold. <laughs> they don't know. What do you mean? 50 is cold. 
The only thing that's cold is their hands because it, you know, <laughs> they're too close to the air conditioning uh, in the house, basically, okay. is the answer. Okay, last one, last one here. Then we'll get into a design here. All right. What's your favorite? Hard top, convertible, this is the question or I forgot. T top? Convertible. No question. Convertible? No question. I mean, I don't really race cars. So the advantage, the, the, Historic advantages of having like a, a hard top over a convertible in a model that has both is a little bit lost on me. Um, mm -hmm. I'm super tall, so I like to be able to have like as much headroom as possible. And I just like driving the open air. I'm also never, ever going to be able to be allowed to own a motorcycle. And I so the closest <laughs> I can get to that like uh, uh, full on freedom experience will be in a, in a convertible too. Um, and a T-top, I just... Yeah, neither neither uh, uh, beast nor <laughs> or <laughs> feast or fowl or whatever the phrase is not gotcha. not really my thing. So fish nor fowl, fish nor fowl. Thank you so much. Yep. All right, well, hey. German <laughs> fish or fowl. <laughs> Fair answers all around, and just listeners, so you know, um, I mean, I mean, Seth Mearsma is is a, just a veteran in the industry. You've been around. Did you did you not get your start with David E. Davis? Uh, yeah. Although I, I, I feel like that I oversell it sometimes a little bit. He was incredibly impactful. Like in my, I don't, th I don't think that's possible to oversell that. I mean, well, I mean, no. he's a legend in the business. Yeah. I mean, he's somebody who, so a good friend of mine, the guy who kind of got me involved in writing about cars in the very beginning is a guy named Riley Brennan. Um, hi Riley, mm -hmm. come on the podcast yep. at some time. Uh, uh, and Welcome he to. was, he was, uh, uh, at, Let's see. He worked for David E. Davis as, a, as a, an assistant for a little while. Um, they knew each other pretty well. I would go to David E.'s office uh, like early in the mornings to watch F1 races uh, for a while because he had this was back when it was it was sort of a special cable package that most people didn't have uh, to be able to watch a lot of the European Formula One races. So we would do that. And then, you know, we were introduced a little bit over time. He was the editor in chief when I was hired at Winding Road. To be clear, he had nothing to do with hiring me at Winding Road. He probably <laughs> just said, "That's fine." Like he didn't. Even, I'm sure he didn't know who my like didn't know my name. Um, but yeah, he was there uh, for the first, you know, not quite a year. I think that I was at Winding Road and in some form or another, and and was incredibly influential. You know, I, I love his writing. I he was a giant figure in the industry. Um, and and just somebody that is almost impossible to forget once you've had even a couple experiences with him. So, no, well, we're th we're thrilled to have you on the podcast. We're thrilled to have you as our boss, and we're not just saying that because you're the boss. Well, maybe <laughs> maybe a little, maybe a little bit. Well, but I, I mean, hey, your knowledge is awesome. Now let's let's use that to let the world know just how wrong you are when it comes <laughs> to automotive design. Um, I, we were talking about this. Bruce and I were talking about this here a few days ago. Mm -hmm. Um. And and we were going to focus on one era, and it's like, well, it's it's, it's yeah. so difficult, right? Mm -hmm. So so let's let's try to just do a quick summary of everything that's out there because we're going to talk about some thing of the things that we like, some of the areas that we like that we don't like, and I mean, we're going all the way back to pre-war. I mean, really, that's that's kind of where it all begins. Well, maybe some of us are like pre World War Two. Right. Uh, let me just say, so to clarify to our regular listeners or first time listeners, you know, we usually kind of try to have a news hook with the show, something that's going on in the industry, something like that. And we looked at things. And right now, as we're talking about this, there's not a whole lot going on. So what we kind of wanted to do was, hey, let's do a more personality focused episode. If mm -hmm. you, you know, this is what the 55th episode, I believe, of rambling about cars. So you know, for anyone who's new to the show, anyone who's returning to the show, get an idea of our personalities, what we like, what we don't like, what we're into, and also what Seth is into. And so we kind of, we talked about it. And yeah, we started out uh, with kind of one era in mind. And we're like, yeah, that's not really going to work. And then we kind of broadened it out. We talked about it. And we finally decided, let's let everyone, uh, you know, all the guests on the show kind of present the era of automotive design, the type, the the, the genre, whatever, let's present that. And that, that way, uh, anyone who listens to this episode will have a little bit of a better idea about who you're listening to, the personality of who you're listening to and what they like. And that's kind of the genesis of all of this. 
And of course, you're going to be sending all of your impressions and your comments and your taste to podcast at motor1.com. You're also going to go to our YouTube channel, Motor One Podcast, and you're going to watch it there, or you're going to listen on one of the dozen or so audio platforms that you're on. You're going to send us feedback because we want to hear about your taste in automotive design. Speaking of which, I mean, we've got, I kind of mentioned at the beginning, pre-war, post-war, the jet age in like the 50s and the 60s, uh, the malaise where, you know, things kind of maybe a little dull, maybe a little interesting in the 70s, 80s. Um, you sort of had the wedge period going on there from the 70s into the 90s. Then we've got sort of like the round era going through the 90s. We're getting into the retro modern. And then I guess you could just kind of bring it up to modern era today. Bruce, I think I would like you to start us off because this this whole podcast, this whole topic was sort of your genesis. Yeah, sure. I would say it was both of our ideas. I would say maybe <laughs> I inspired things. But he doesn't um, want to be fully culpable for this in other words. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. so if, if it completely a fiasco, if it completely bombs, then, uh, yeah, it's, don't it's, blame it's, me. It's not gonna bomb, let it rip. Anyway, so I'm going to go chronologically rather than in terms of my favorite, because I think the second one I have to present is my favorite. But uh, I've said it before. You don't sh start the show with a showstopper. So I'm going to start with one that's maybe less less loved, but something I still have to talk about. And that is the automotive design of the early 1960s. And for anyone okay. who is watching on YouTube and for Seth, who is seeing this image what? right now, and for Smith, who is seeing this image right <laughs> oh now, God. this is one of our, fam our favorite automotive press shots. This is an image of a 1960 Chevrolet Corvair uh, in front of a T-38 Talon trainer jet aircraft. Um, I don't know where it was at the time, but I know where the aircraft is now. Smith, will you tell us where the aircraft is now? I know exactly where the aircraft is. It's about 15 miles away from me sitting outside of Ellsworth Air Force Base at the South Dakota Air and Space Museum. And don't you think I haven't tried since I've freaking been here to find somebody with a Corvair to get out there to retake this photo? Because that's, that that's the exact same aircraft. I need, exactly. I need a quick timeout. I need a quick timeout, though. Sure. Go for it. Because... Bruce, all right. So you guys clearly have an agenda here. This is good because this will be this will start the argument, which is really why I'm on the podcast, right? I guess. Yeah. We're we're and we like you. <laughs> we're starting out with the '60s, which I agree is one of the most fantastic, like innovative, creative uh, eras for automotive design. You're starting out with a Corvair, which actually has some really interesting models and some crazy design, and then you pull up this perhaps the ugliest formulation of Corvair. It's a sedan. It's red with red hubcaps. It is like the worst example of a Corvair that you could possibly imagine. And we're kicking off our design competition. So this is, I'm saying the bar is set very low now. <laughs> oh, I, I, I Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. So, I mean, what I go, uh, go, ahead. go ahead, Smith, real quick. No, no, no. Uh, oh, yeah. I, uh, Seth's not entirely wrong because I'm a Corvair fan, but and I love the jet, but damn, Bruce. <laughs> well, I had to start somewhere. But what I want to specifically say is I'm speaking specifically of the early 1960s and early. I'm kind of cutting off at about 1965. I'm sure there's some stuff afterwards, but specifically the early 1960s. And I was thinking a lot about this before we recorded this episode. And if you look at American car design, especially from the late 1950s, you get what I can only describe to describe as a whimsical look. You get the huge fins, you get the big bumpers that like stick out really far in the front and are chrome. And for whatever reason, that there was a shift right around, this is a 60 Corvair, right around 1960, 1961. And I'll have some other pictures to show for our YouTube watchers here in a moment. But you get this shift that it, it almost seems like I don't... It, I tried to think about this. I don't know if a new generation of designers came along. I don't know what the shift was, but you get this much more kind of simple pared down look in the early 1960s. And then in the late 60s, you get the, you know, the Coke bottle shapes and you get, you know, a, a much wilder design. And then you get the malaise era in the 1970s. But there's this sweet spot that automotive design kind of simplified itself it pared itself down and just some kind of really good beautiful designs came of that um since you hated the first corvair i showed i have to 
uh, just make you mad. And I'm going to show you another Corvair if you're watching on YouTube it, now. If, if it's a Monza, I'm cool with that. Like a later Monza. I love Corvairs. I'll, I'll, I've got another one. Yeah, I've got a later Corvair here. But yeah, I just think that there's something pure and beautiful about that shape. It's slightly boxy, but then if you look at the A-pillars, it's still curved like the Chevys of that period. It's small. It's got a, you know, a rear engine, air-cooled flat six. You know, People have called it the American Volkswagen. Some, I would say, I don't know if I agree with them, but the American Porsche. But there is something to that. Um, and it's not just Corvair, and uh, you know that should be known. Um, I'm going to pull up the Corvair's kind of major American competitor here, and that is the Ford Falcon, which it, it's not quite as boxy, but it does a lot of the exact same things. It's a small car with, it, I would almost call it European styling, and I'm I got to be honest, I'm kind of talking out of my butt here, but it almost seems like American designers learned about Bauhaus sometime in the 50s and the (laughs) post-war period, and they decided that they wanted to take that simple pared down form follows function look, and they decided to apply it to small cars. And I just, I dig it. Like, I think this is a real high point in design. Um, I, while we're talking about this, let me see if I can find it here. Um, I was looking, and uh, anyone who has followed this show knows I am also a fan, a fan of Rambler uh, and AMC. And yeah, here it is. So here will be a 58 Rambler, which has kind of all of the excess of late 50 styling. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, it'll be up. And if not, I will describe it to you right now. Um, and so this is a 58 Rambler. It's got this weird, uh, it has no B pillar first off. So it's just a vertical A pillar. It's pillarless in the middle. And it's got the C pillar that goes diagonally backwards towards the body. Mm-hmm. And then it's got these big pointy fins on it. And it's just, it, it's a lot of excess and it, it, it's just a lot like all of the other cars at, of the period. And then um, I always thought that car was like a like a cross between a 57 Chevy with the roof of a 59 Ford um, shrunk down like half the size of both of those cars. It's a it's certainly an odd. It's it's an odd vehicle. It's kind of an odd choice for you, Bruce. I'm, I'm a little surprised. This well, one. No, no, no. I, I what I'm saying here, though. So that was the 58. Here is 63. And even Rambler is taking this thing on. It's still pillarless. But it's got a much more upright, just kind of simpler styling. Like yeah. the fins are gone. A lot of the aspects are just gone, and it's just a pared down, simpler look. And I, I just, I, I am attracted to that aesthetic. Um, this is this is a, a more extreme version of it. But when I see all these, so yeah, what you're showing me is clean body side, right? Like there's, there's no yes. real ornamentation squared off, like very sort of minimal design. I think the Bauhaus thing is maybe correct. I have no idea. It is actually really an interesting question because the other commonality between these is these are all sort of compact cars, right? These right. were economy cars at the time. So they, and they share probably like you'd see in most eras, they kind of share a design ethos with one another, even though they're very distinct, they have some mm-hmm. things that are in common too. So where designers were finding their playbook, I'm not sure. To, I thought the same thing, Bruce. I thought like this feels like they're kind of cribbing off of maybe then what were becoming increasingly popular sort of small sedan models in Europe, right? So they're looking mm-hmm. at a little bit like what Mercedes is doing, probably probably most, but um, might be a little bit early for BMW, but like just getting into that like that very trim sort of what we would call now a sports sedan, right? But right. different underpinnings, different orientation in terms of driving, but from styling exactly. point of view, I can see it a little bit. It, it is really cool when you stack them up like that. I don't know that it, I find it beautiful. I find it that's fascinating. It's a really interesting point. And um, Smith, real quick, you just you uh, were talking about the Corvair Monza. Here's your Corvair Monza. This is the second generation Corvair yeah. where it loses the upright styling. It becomes a much sleeker. And honestly, I have to say, and I know my dad who listens to the show will disagree with me. I think the center, second generation Corvair is more attractive. Like, oh, yeah, you look at that. Yeah. And it's it's just gorgeous. Like you could understand 
why someone would be attracted to that car, especially in the era that it, it's it's sleek. It's got kind of a smoother look to it, but it's still it's not overly styled. You can see even by the by the uh, the qualities of the time, it's got a very simple chrome bumper, very simple chrome rear bumper. Uh, you know, chrome cladding along the side just as kind of a little accent, but the rest of the body is very pure and it's just black and it it just looks good. It's just not overly styled. And that's what I like. I feel like later on in the 60s and certainly into the 70s, things kind of went, in my opinion, they went in the wrong direction for my personal aesthetic, whereas these cars just nail it. Well, I think the big greenhouse with the complete lack of any sort of B-pillar it, I mean, that's just that's defines the Corvair, uh, that that particular model. I think it looks fantastic. I can approve that one, Bruce. I, th- that makes up for the uh, that makes up for the first one. The model okay, pretty good. fair enough. Yeah. And, and you know what happened in that in that mods in the second generation, too, in, from my point of view, is they made the they made the grill less weird. Right. We see this now sure. with electric vehicles, too, where there's no need for air intake in the front. Like they were sort of playing with different ideas. And in the first generation, they're like, we're going to be really obvious about it. We're going to we're going to like like completely make it sheet metal with a little strip of chrome, no grill at all. So people know the engines in the back. This one, they retreat from that a little bit, make it look at a uh, you know, a little bit more conventional, I would say, from the mm-hmm. front end, which was pretty attractive on that car too. But um, yeah, those are interesting choices. That's all very cool. What's a okay. hit you next one, Bruce? Oh no, I figured we'd go round robin. Um, oh, you want you want to go round robin? To, I can. What? All right. Well, I'll tell you what, Seth. You want to go next? Are you ready? Sure. I only have one era, but I can I can spitball. But <laughs> okay. no, that's fine. Okay, one cool. era out of a hundred and I, I well, can't do no, 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 <laughs> after no, after no. a lot of years. So let, listen, let me let me let me dovetail on what on what we just heard for Bruce because I did I went back and forth a little bit too. I think that my 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 true pick will do next, but my my first pick, my sort of second choice, was also cars from the '60s, right? And I was looking at very different cars, but. Um, you know, there are there are cars like, uh, you know, of course, like Lamborghini Mur- Miria. There's like a Mercedes 280 SL uh, Pagoda, right, which yeah. immediately some of that some of that same like very clean um, linear body side, super thin pillars, airy, light feeling um, the cars from that age. And, and really, I think the cars from kind of what I think of as like the pre digital age, right, where where the designers were working. Uh, a lot more conventionally. They weren't working on computers, of course, at that point, but they were working and, and not like they were sketching everything by hand, but there was less of a barrier between what they could imagine and what they could draw and what was actually then being created on the uh, on the cars, what you would see like rolling out onto showroom floors. That's really fascinating to me. It's, it's, it's much more in, in a lot of ways, the cars feel from that era feel more organic, you know, and, and, to your point, Bruce, as the as the '60s kind of turned into the '70s, they got a little bit more muscular. They got bigger. They were they had their own constraints then too. They were you know encapsulating gigantic engines, and there was a, pr- a premium, especially in the U.S., on having huge cabins with big bench seats and lots of room for all the kids, mm-hmm. uh, storage space. But but doing that in sort of uh, of the cars that we really remember, doing that in really racy shapes. Um, but they weren't constrained by the things that we deal with now like um crash standards <laughs> right like <laughs> yeah. they don't they didn't have to deal with like so yep. much safety gear and so so much uh kind of electronics that are in the car um you know they could be as low and sleek um they could look aerodynamic without actually having to be aerodynamic which i think and, is a, and really a lot cool. of them weren't right yeah right. no exactly like the, the mirror is a great example right of i mean i don't know how it stands up in a wind tunnel but you look at that car and you like this you think this thing is going to absolutely cut through the air Mm-hmm. But who knows what's happening with the turbulence, like around, especially like after the. Uh, if I the- remember correctly, those cars experienced severe front end lift at like a hundred or so miles an hour. That they really started to get light on the front. Yeah, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I certainly wouldn't be surprised, right? You, you, you do see this too in performance cars mm-hmm. and racing cars, where it's like, all right, well, we kind of like drew this shape and it looked beautiful, and then we brought it on the track, and we're like, well, damn, now we have to put a gigantic eight foot wing on it, <laughs> on the on the rear <laughs> end, just, just to make it drivable at a hundred miles an hour. Mm-hmm. So, in any event, like that's the, I think the fifties and the sixties and probably the early part of the seventies, like all fall into that where it's, to me, it speaks a lot more to the, the capabilities of like 
the human imagination and like real like old school manufacturing and engineering techniques, but less about the sort of um, what we deal with as we go forward, which is these very complex systems and and you know much different like sort of a regulatory uh, 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 landscape that right. that causes that has its own impact on what you actually see as cars. So. Um, there's no wonder that these are these are seen as as vehicles that are associated with like you know more of a kind of like free spirited era and and just just a lot lighter weight I suppose. Well, no, I guess I mean if you think about it, um, that era is you could almost say is the first point where designers really had something of a of a just a an empty canvas to work with because if you think about pre war, I mean that at that point there's still a lot of just like basic functionality. We have an engine, we have wheels, just design something to fit around that and get people down the road. And then World War II comes along. Obviously, attention is focused elsewhere. Now here comes the 50s and you're moving into the 60s. And OK, now maybe we can think a little bit more about just design and just creating some extravagant vehicles. And let me just say, I mean, is there any Italian car from the 60s that doesn't look good? <laughs> I'm oh, sure there is. Uh, there I'm probably sure they, is, but I'm sure they exist. Yeah. Somebody's gonna send in like some some obscure fiat that we've never heard of, but but no, again, I, I mean, you the way you ask that off the top of my head, I don't think I can't think of one. I there isn't one that immediately comes to mind. No, you know that. No, of most of the ugly era. ones are American. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, probably no, it, probably you're not wrong there. there. There are probably some ugly British cars from that era too. Not the not the convertibles that we all got over here, but the uh, you know, the the boxy <laughs> sort of triumphs and MGs. Yeah, yeah. This is very very pre-war. <laughs> no, no, yeah. So for anyone watching, I pulled up a picture of a Duesenberg just for the kind of to show the pre-war aesthetic. That sure. you know, massive engine, just but, gargantuan engine, and not a whole lot of aerodynamics. To, you know to make you go fast yeah but i mean that duesenberg i mean spoiler alert i'm gonna be talking about the 30s here in a little bit well i think you're up next so i think it might be time I'm, to talk I'm, about I'm, the 30s now i'm up next okay well i mean yeah. we can talk about the 30s a little bit um yeah i mean you had i guess to dovetail off what i was talking about i mean we're talking about like the very beginnings of the automotive world right and there was the okay the necessity here's what we have we have the engine we have axles we have to have seats somewhere we have to have some place to put fuel and the design was just kind of based around the necessity and then as you move through the 20s and into the 30s you're starting to see cars like the Duesenberg um one of my favorites still to this day and in fact i would say this is probably in my top 3 I won't say number one, but I will definitely say top three vehicles I would love to have in my garage one day. An original Auburn Boat Tail Speedster. Oh, yeah. I mean, such a gorgeous car. Beautiful. But I was expecting a Cord, but yeah, that those are good. Uh, too. Uh, cord is nice as well. But I mean, when you look at it, okay, I, I mean, it, it kind of looks like every other car from the 30s, right? It's got just those huge fish tank round headlights. It's got just the big upright grill, the very long hood, because like you were saying, Bruce, I mean, straight eight engines, V16 engines, they were all over the place back then. Right. Um, you've got the big wheel arches front and rear, but the, the boat tail, whereas everything else had just a, a nice straight upright windshield. That's got the really, just the really raked back windshield, um, it has the tail, obviously the boat tail that wraps in on the back side. That's just one of the prettiest cars of all time for me. And when you talk about a design era, yes, there wasn't there wasn't significant variation in the 1930s. But for some reason, and it's not like I was born in the 30s. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm the elder guy here. Oh, you're I've not got that a, old. I've, I've got a, I've got a couple years on Seth, but I'm, I'm not dating back to the 30s here. That's like I mean, that era is just, I think, one of the most glamorous of all time. When you talk about the Duesenbergs, the Cords, the Auburns like these. I mean, th that was that was back when Cadillac was like a world standard. It like was a the legit, standard of the world. That like, was like their... a legit world standard. If you had a big V16 Cadillac, it was just something special, right? 
Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, I would have to say, is, is the 30s my favorite design era? I don't know about that, but it's it's certainly one of my favorites. Um, just, just for the reasons that I described, there's still a lot of functionality involved there. It, it was also like the last great period of coach building. I know mm-hmm. Toyota is yes. trying to bring that back now with the, with the Supra. I mean, I mean, Toyota is just going to be a, you know, coach builder for BMW. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've You're said mean. it before. I'll, I'll keep saying it again. Um, or is Subaru going to be a coach builder for Toyota? <laughs> But but you're right. This is that's that's the the thing that gets me really excited about cars from the 30s. One is like I don't know as much about the cars that that kind of well I, I mean I do like there are sort there there's you know the cars that uh, Model A and things that Ford were were churning out, right? But for the most part the cars that we remember, the cars that we like put in books or you know build models of and and talk about still are cars that were for the ultra wealthy and that still drive design today, you know, mm-hmm. like um yeah, the and there's so many reasons too. You're looking at, um, uh, you know, even the wheel design. Even when you're looking at these essentially like big, they're sort of wagon wheels on on giant balloon tires with white walls and stuff. The way that the the way that the the uh, sidewall itself is proportioned and and made white uh, in so often is giving you so, sort of the same effect that you see these days on when when cars are going on increasingly large wheels, right? You're getting that that same profile and that same stance mm-hmm. um, that feels really athletic, even in a car that's, you know, in a lot of cases it might have a wooden frame <laughs> or at least like <laughs> yeah. a partially wooden frame. Right. So, yeah. Oh, for sure. And, and just and to build off feels so unique. So, yeah. And just to build off that, it, uh, what you were saying, I think it, you could almost call it the democratization of speed or the democratization of aerodynamics that, Again, in the 1930s, the average person was driving a Model A, a, you know, Model T, Chevrolet, something like that. The models that we're looking at here were for the ultra, ultra, ultra wealthy. But right. as you look over the course of the 20th century, that the, that kind of performance becomes more and more accessible to the normal person. Especially, mm-hmm. you know, you could talk about the muscle car muscle car era of the 60s and very early 70s, where someone in their 20s or 30s could afford a car that was faster than um, we're looking at a Tabo Lago if you're watching on YouTube here, mm-hmm. or by the 90s or even today, where you know a, a Hellcat, a a Shelby GT 500, something like that, that they are expensive vehicles, but they're not so expensive that you have to be the 0.1% to own them. You could be, you know, uh, we kind of talked about this Smith when we were talking to Tom Malogny about the model S plaid that, yeah, a model S plaid might be a uh, hundred and thirty grand, but that is in the realm of a doctor or a lawyer. It's not in the realm. You don't have to be Elon Musk or, obviously, or uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or something like that to own that type of vehicle, that they're, it, it's accessible in its own certain way mm-hmm. versus a hyper car that costs one, two, three million dollars. Yeah. What did a, what did a, uh, like a type 57 Bugatti cost in the, in like 35 or what I have no, I, I don't actually know when those cars were built, but like, I'm sure it was, you know, many, many times uh, the the average salary of the average you know American or or worker in an industrial yeah, I mean, country. I mean, in in context, those were very very specialized cars. But you know mm-hmm. what, a thirty two Ford I still think looks great. Sure, agreed. Um, a thirty five Chevy looks great. Um, I wasn't too keen on the Oldsmobiles of the era, to be honest. But I mean, I mean those those are some more. I'm, 32 Ford is probably about as pedestrian as you can get. And how many of those have been turned into street rods over the years just uh, just for their timeless design, I would say. I mean, so, for some reason, that's that was like the Honda, popular, Honda Civic of its day, right? They were popular in their day, though, as well. I was just listening to a podcast about Bonnie and Clyde and Clyde Barrow. He specifically went after four, 32 Ford V8s because that was, you know, you could outrun the police at the time. Like that was even in its day, that was an impressive vehicle. Didn't Ford use it in advertising? Is that a, is that a, a myth or is that a, apocryphal? I, I thought I that know. there was a story that Ford used something about the uh, you know uh, Bonnie and Clyde to advertise a flathead V8, which maybe I, I'm making that up or I, I might be. I've never it. heard that, but that I, I don't know one way. It's is interesting. Um, Get at me, podcast <laughs> listeners. If I'm wrong, if I'm right, 
Yeah, podcast and motor one. Let us know on that one. Happy, happy to be either. <laughs> okay, right, Bruce, so, Bruce, uh, come on. Let's. I've, I've been yeah. waiting for this. I've been waiting for this. I know what you're going to do here. I think uh, you probably do. So. I want to talk about the wedge era, which is kind of the whole thing that started this podcast mm. topic. Um, I wrote up a story. Um, RM Sotheby's is going to be selling off this incredibly ugly Ferrari. Um, I'm going to pull up a picture for you uh, of it now. It's just the ugliest Ferrari I've ever seen, but it is, it might be the quintessential wedge Ferrari. Uh, you know, there was the 308 GT4, which predated the 308. But um, I'm going to pull this photo up now. This thing is ugly as sin. It is called the Mira S. It was de designed by Micheletti. Um, uh, he designed, he previously worked for Vignali um, back in the day. He designed a lot of very attractive Ferraris. It's just this isn't one of them. Um, and it looks. It's like the love child of a first gen Mazda RX-7 oh, and a yeah. Mitsubishi Starion. And it's just awful looking for a Ferrari. And only one exists. So, you know, you don't have to feel bad. There's only one of them. But this was the vehicle that kind of started this idea. Smith, you know, we uh, we brainstorm ideas in our chat. And he's like, what do you want to talk about? And I'm like, I'm writing about this. And I'm thinking about wedge-shaped cars and the wedge-shaped oh. kind of design language. <laughs> that I, I didn't, rough. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't think the car was that ugly until we got to the profile picture. I mean, <laughs> I mean, well, if you're if you're listening, I would suggest if you don't go to our podcast channel on YouTube to see this, go to motorone.com and search up Ferrari Mira M E E R A, and you can see Bruce's yeah. article. Yeah, I, I I I admit I didn't go through all the pictures on the article, and I was like, oh, that guy doesn't look so bad. And then you get to the profile, and it's like, did somebody kick it in the butt? Yeah, because <laughs> it's like right. it's like it's bent upwards a little bit for no apparent reason. From from the front, dead front and front three quarters, you're sort of like, okay, so they took they kind of took like a Daytona and screwed it up a little. They louvered up the you know the grill or something, but no, it is that that profile is rough. Wow. Cool wheels, but oh oh, it gets worse as you go to the back. Yeah, yeah. the back's rough, but this is the car that kind of inspired this whole topic. But I have a love for the wedge shape kind of design era. And I, I, I looked at it a lot in preparing for this episode. And from what I can see, it kind of dates from the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, there were several concepts at that time. There's some, the Alfa Romeo Carabo. Um, uh, there were a few others. Um, the first one that kind of put it into production was the De Tomaso Mangusta from, I believe a 67 or 68. But it really kicked off in the 1970s. That's when you start seeing the concepts for the Countach, for, as Seth mentioned earlier, the Lancia Stratos, the Pantera. Uh, the pan yeah. It, yeah. It, 70s is when it kind of became a thing in supercars. And then in the 80s, and it kind of ties into what I was talking about earlier, it became democratized that like you could own a car that looked like this. You could own a first or second gen Mazda RX-7. Um, what I just compared this to, you could own a Mazda, uh, not Mazda, Mitsubishi Starion. And I, I'm alluding to what I'll be talking about later, but even like the C4 Corvette took on the wedge shaped look that kind of just yeah. became the de facto look of what a performance car would look like. Yeah. And flatten I, it out, give it pop up headlights. And uh, is thank you for mentioning that is that the pop up headlights were the thing. And I was thinking about that as we were preparing for this episode and it was its form follows function in its own certain way that you you think about it from a designer's point of view. Oh, I'm not going to use the, the headlights all the time. So mm -hmm. let's hide them away and have better aerodynamics. But you end up adding the mechanisms and the electric motors and stuff like that to add the pop-up headlights in. And it probably ends up adding more weight to the vehicle. But if you look at it purely as a design and profile, it's such a cleaner shape. It's just this wedge of vehicle that's slicing through the air and it's gorgeous and it makes sense in that sort of way it's like it, it's almost like the designer and the engineer didn't talk to each other and it's like the designer's like oh yeah this is going to slice through the air it's going to look fantastic and the engineer's like 
yeah, but I got to get the headlights to come up somehow because you're going to drive it at night eventually <laughs> and you get this kind of weird thing. Um, yeah, it's, so. it, you look at now what's happening now with, you know, and, and been happening for, you know, shoot, 20 years almost with LED headlights, right? As they've been getting mm -hmm. smaller and brighter and more malleable. And now they're, we're at the point where basically they can be anything. They can be as, uh, as small as a pinprick and as long as the entire surface of your car if you want them to be, right? Yeah, the Stratus, the Stratus is awesome. The one that I had pulled up when, when you were talking about this, Bruce, though, if you want to maybe go to this next is the... Um, the original, I think it's called the Lancia, uh, Lancia Stratos Zero the HB car. Yeah, yep, yep, yeah. Yep. That, I can pull amazing. that up. I've got that uh, pulled up as well. But the, it's, the, the, the Stratos it's the Zero. Uh, I th well, yeah, the HF Zero. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. We we got a story about it. This guy. Um, oh, uh, the 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 dome. The dome. No, that is not the dome. I that's have not the that's, pictures. That's not the dome. That is not the dome. Okay. I'll, I'll shut up then. I'll let you guys handle this one. No, I'm, I'll, my, my, <laughs> my whole point was that you can see like the same thing happening, right? Where designers were like, suddenly they have this new technology. Oh, I have the ability to hide the headlights, whether they're pop up or the kinds that kind of roll over. Uh, it was the the uh, 968. Remember the the strange headlights are sort of pop up, but they don't mm -hmm. really pop up in the Porsche yep. 968. I do. Um, yeah. But what the they're they're being told the engineers are saying we now have this ability to hide the headlights, clean up your profile all the time, and and it changes the way that you think about the front end of the car. And we like this is absolutely exploding right now. In the last, really, in the last five years, it's gone crazy. Look at all the stuff that like Hyundai Kia is doing with the uh, mm -hmm. like crazy uh, lighting elements in the front and rear. Really, everybody is is just making a light signature anything that they can draw, right? It, it can be any shape that they want it to be. And it changes the entire nature of how you design a car. So, um. and, and you know, that's an interesting point to make too. Um, something that I thought we might talk about tonight, but I think it really deserves just its own segment as we're moving into electric cars. Now that's, mm -hmm. that's, I feel like we're just at the tip of the, of the iceberg on how future car design is going to look because like you were talking about with the Corvair, Seth, um, with the engine in the back, it was like, okay, well, you know, we can completely change things around with no engine at all. Now, okay, you don't need to have any provisions for an engine. You also don't need to have any position provisions for a drive shaft, for a transmission tunnel, for anything like that. Yep. Um, you don't need to have provisions for a fuel tank. You need to have batteries. But I, I feel like, I feel like designers haven't really totally embraced what they can do yet, or or if they have, they're too afraid to uh, to come up with something and really put it in, into production because what we're seeing in my opinion with with current electric cars they they still feel like they're rooted to some degree with internal combustion power and i'm really excited to, to see somebody come up with something that's just like functional and awesome and completely different you know and i don't know how long it's going to take for that uh for that mentality to come through but uh well, I, I think it's an interesting time they've got to sell it too right so that's and, and i'm yeah. First of all, as a quick aside, I thought where you were going with that segue was a full episode on pop-up headlights, which I think is also <laughs> something that we should do. <laughs> but but yeah, they've still got to sell the car, and I think we're so you know as humans we are we are attuned to be feel comfortable with the familiar, right? And and as we all know, like doing this business and like being on car Twitter and that stuff, you can see when something new comes out when it's a little bit radical. The the most natural response in the world is to say. I don't oh. like that. I can't yep. understand it, right? So it takes a lot of it's this sort of like slowly chipping away at all of our collective psyche to understand like, oh, maybe I do like that. Maybe it is a, you know, I can I can let go of some of these conventions that uh, I'm okay with. But that's why this stuff is amazing, right? When you're seeing concept cars that are truly pushing the envelope, causing you to think about cars in a completely different way, that gets me really excited. And I over-index for that. I over-index for ugly stuff that's making me uh, uh, <laughs> think a little harder about about what a vehicle could be. Right. And of course, while I was uh, looking up pictures of the Dome Zero, Bruce had to beat me by like 10 seconds and share oh, a picture of the Dome Zero concept. On so YouTube. real quick for anyone listening, the Dome Zero, I believe it is for either from 77 or 78. It is a Japanese yep. concept. It used the running gear from a Nissan 240Z, but mid mounted it. And so if you're watching on YouTube right now, you're seeing it in profile and it is just it is the it, perfect wedge. It, it, it could is, be the wedgiest wedge that ever wedged. Ever, it is, yeah. It, um, it may also be Dome. Dome? Oh, is, 
Don't I, I? I'm not I'm not positive on that, but uh, it okay. wouldn't be rambling about cards if I didn't screw up a pronunciation <laughs> on something. So you're I probably thought it was right. Dome as well, but you're right. It is Japanese, so it could be Dome. Dome. Um, regardless, in the late 70s, they came out with this concept and apparently it was very close to entering production because it did. Like I said, it used Nissan running gear. It just they put this gorgeous body on top of it and. Yeah, it just never happened, but it's really fun, pretty. Fun fact regarding the Dome Zero for all of you first generation Transformers fans. Do you remember Hot Rod from the uh from like the second run of the first generation? Hot Rod was actually based on the Dome Zero. I did not know that. I don't I, I don't know that about either. Hot Rod. But I mean I mean old? imagine imagine just like a little V six engine sticking out of the hood with the big chrome pipes <laughs> It'd be on the in side. Six, bud. And uh, well, it's Hot Rod, man. It it would be V six because okay. I'm Hot Rod, has, to hot rod has a little V six, a, okay. a little engine sticking out of his hood, and also he turns into a robot. So I mean, that completely blows the the, the realism out of the out of the water. But yeah, <laughs> it took. I I never I never knew that until because I'm big Transformers fan, obviously big Hot Rod fan. Um, I never knew that until I it was like 2010 or so when I when I learned that. And it was like I'm looking at the car. It's like. Wow. Okay. Paint it orange. Put some flames on the side, and it's freaking hot rod. I'm down with that. <laughs> well, Dig for it. time preferences, will it upset you guys if I'm the only one that gets to present two and we do some comments and then do a cheap car challenge, or does anyone feel really passionate about something else they had prepared? Well, the only well, thing I, is, I didn't really present mine. I, I thought I was giving my backup. So, oh, I, I'm I sorry. Can, no, no, that's okay. I can I can run through it super quickly because I've been over talking both of you the entire time. So, not at all. <laughs> Go <laughs> ahead. Really, um, so, so here, here's my thing, right? Like we, I talked about this a little bit with the sixties cars. I really love that purity of design and the innovation, the human innovation that, that we've been talking about a lot. But I think that around the, especially the early two thousands was when from a design perspective, I think, um, basically I, my, my, my rudimentary understanding is that software was getting a lot better modeling was getting a lot better things like even like rapid prototyping to try and like understand how these things would go together was was starting to come into play and that led to this completely different kind of innovation where you were having incredibly complex cars much more complicated designs and much more i won't say nuance but like more elements to them uh came into play and that's so that was netted out in the cars in sort of the first decade of the 2000s, the early 2000s. And I think you see this okay. in the, the car that I love, probably like from a design perspective, it might be one of my all time favorites. Certainly it's on my Mount Rushmore of car designs is the Mark one Audi TT. Like, I just think that's an incredibly beautiful design. I think it's um, uh, it was it came out of nowhere. Like when I saw that car, I couldn't. I, I had never even conceived of anything looking that way before. I didn't really have words to describe it. I thought it seemed like it was an incredible performance car, even though I'm sure when I when I first you know encountered it, I wasn't looking at it and thinking like, well, there's probably a gulf under there, right? So all the things that the car kind of gets dogged for, and maybe even rightly so in terms of performance and driving and stuff like that, don't matter to me in terms of like the way that the design uh, came together. So that's um, that's one of them. But you you go down the list and there are. The other, you know, Audi is also like the um, the R8, the first R8 came out, I think did, mm -hmm. you know, was doing some incredible things and really changing people's perception of what a supercar could look like. Uh, just the ones that I have. So there, of course, there are the supercars. There's like a Ferrari 458, which I think is incredible, maybe a little bit more traditional in the way that it was uh, a, the design was approached. Um, an Aston DB9 was another, I think, one of the more beautiful Astons of all time was that was that DB9. Um, and, and then there's, uh, you know, like stuff that's a little bit more, uh, not quite blue collar, but accessible for sure. Uh, like a, an E46 three series, uh, which is a car that I've, I've owned and have personal connections with. And I just think it's a really like stunning example of, again, like sort of a complex body side. There are a lot of things going on with shapes and forms in there too. But at the end of the day, it's doing a little bit of what, uh, Bruce was talking about at the beginning with the cars from the early sixties, right? Like a very cleaned up body side squared off super Teutonic, you know, looking design, but with big wheels and, and definitely spoke to performance. So a um, lot of cars in that, in that first decade of this century that I have a huge fondness for um, uh, from a design perspective. Okay. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah. That there was, you know, the E46 
especially, I feel like, especially as the coupe. And when I look at that car, it just looks like a fist going down the road. It's very upright. It's very aggressive. It's just like, like that's the only way I can think of it. So it, it's a uh, pirate, basically. basically yeah. <laughs> well, let me let me. I, I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. But uh, let me just counter that opinion um, with because oh, we're also. I, I mean, let's. I mean, let's be realistic. We're also talking about the retro modern era, and that's the one you pick. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, this is an era that I'm not really a fan of. I, I would say this this is this is probably one of my worst picks. There, there were some neat ideas and and some hits. Um, For anyone listening, this is the revived oh, yeah. Ford Thunderbird. Yep the the rebooted Thunderbird that came out right right uh, at the beginning of the 21st century and in my opinion the absolute worst case for the whole retro modern craze that really started in that era. Um, it's among the worst at at the time. And and guys, tell me if you agree with this. At the time, I think a lot of the retro modern designs coming out were catchy. I don't think this was one of them. Um, no, I, but, no, but I has, agree. But I has, think the Mini worked. I think the Volkswagen Beetle worked. But have I they would aged? Even say the PT Cruiser worked. Ha, have they aged well though? Because from that era, I, I mean, th there aren't really any of those retro modern designs that I'm particularly interested in, and that includes the Mustang. And I got one we, for we you. all know that I'm kind of a Mustang guy, and just that that era just uh, it just didn't do it for me. Revived four GT worked. Yeah, Ford GT was it was a good okay. Game. Yeah, but that really wasn't retro modern. That was just of course retro. that was retro modern. It was just retro with a modern engine. I mean, the design was <laughs> was almost freaking the same, right? Well, one I like that we're basically just like focusing in on Jay Mays here. <laughs> so <laughs> you might have more of an issue with Jay Mays than you do with an era. Uh, but yeah, no, you're. I mean, listen, I think that if we had the, this same discussion in reverse and went through and talked about the worst of the era, I we could we could probably have a really good uh, debate about you know some of the worst cars from each of the, these eras too. So for sure, I'm not saying that the 2000s is the best era. Uh, no a blanket statement. I'm just saying that some of my favorite design some of my favorite design work and and a lot of the innovation that was happening there like uh that era like really speaks to me so we could always go with a 77 ford thunderbird look at that we have we have one of these on youtube right now that's what even has t-tops look at that thing listen the first thunderbird was the only good one the rest the, of the them 55 to 57 garbage. The 55 to 57 were good. I actually grew up. My family had a 57 Thunderbird. So I, I uh, was fortunate enough to drive one through high school occasionally when they would let me. Very cool car. Um, I think the 80s birds, come on, the 83 to, to 88, those I things are hot, there. man. I can't get there. <laughs> You'll get so there. Smith, we are n uh, we're touching an hour here. So yep. would you mind if we skip uh, um, comments and we just went to our cheap car challenge? Let me do just one quick comment, just because this right. is a poignant comment one. that um, that I think is important to read um, and, and let everybody know where we're at here on the Rambling About Cars podcast, because this was a okay. comment that, that, yeah. that came into us, but it was addressed to me specifically regarding last week's um, episode. And I'm just going to summarize it here. Um, th this comes from just a person named Pat. We're just going to leave it at that. Um, I just listened to the best and worst edition of the show. I was very offended by the negative way Smith referred to podcast listeners, saying that it was like listening to an eight track or words to that effect was rude. Um, the, the commenter goes on to say that um, they listen. They don't watch on YouTube. They only listen through audio. Um, and they felt like that comment was basically saying if if you're listening to us on audio then you're stuck in the 1970s um which <laughs> considering the 77 thunderbird i just posted i could actually be stuck in the 1970s so if if i was insulting anybody i was actually insulting myself there but um the point i wanted to make i actually um contacted this uh this commenter personally we had a good back and forth just a complete misunderstanding that it was we were just kind of going back and forth about youtube versus audio it was like a quick back and forth uh we'd shared a photo and one of our guests started talking about the photo before saying 
what the car was. And it's like, yes. well, we, we have to we have to let people on audio know what we're what we're looking at. Right. Um, and it was kind of like, oh, audio. What pe- people listen to audio? What it was like this old eight track technology. What is that? So I was actually talking about this technology, just a fun back and forth. Um, but I certainly didn't mean to offend anybody. Um, so if, if anybody caught that in the wrong way, hey, send us your hate email podcast at motor one dot com. We read it all, the good stuff, the bad stuff. And if if there is a little slight there, hey, we'll own up to it. Um, certainly didn't mean anything by it. We appreciate everybody that's listening. We certainly appreciate everybody on our audio channels because, yes, we are trying to push YouTube. We would like to grow the YouTube channel a little bit, but we're on over a dozen audio platforms rambling about cars. Um, and often and- audio is – there have been many, many times audio is bigger than video. So Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's and that's why we're trying to push the YouTube channel a little bit. Um, But I want everybody to know we will always, always, always be an audio friendly podcast. If you do have the chance to go to YouTube, you can check us out there. We're going to read more comments next week. Um, Appreciate that one. But now, since we've been talking about design, we decided we have to do a cheap car challenge. We have to try to find something from our favorite era, or at least the area, an era that we really enjoy and appreciate that we could actually just put in our garage right now. Um, so I we, think we given set, the time, we each yep. have time for one each. I know some of us prepared more than that. We get one each. Pick your favorite. Let's go around the clock. All right. You want me to go first? I'll go first. Yeah, you're talking. You go first. Actually, you know what? You go first, or Seth goes first. I I forgot. I got to pull this one up here really quick. Okay, I, I'll go first. Um, ooh, I gotta pick. All right, I'm picking. The, uh, I'm picking my favorite here. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, I, I I have to try to figure out which one I want to. I'm trying to stall a little bit uh, cause because I like the them thing both. is, I I prepared several and I had to pick my favorite. Like I was saying, the wedge shaped car design thing it just does it for me. Uh, so. This is a 1986 Porsche 944 with low miles. I don't know why the owner put the fake uh, hood scoop on this car. (laughs) I would take it off immediately, but it's $8,500. That is um, just real quick. We said uh, 10,000 was our limit. So all these cars are going to be less than $10,000. 86 though, this is post refresh, which... The big deal is, is that sometime in, I believe, 86, maybe it was 85, uh, midway through production, they went from uh, individual binacles for the uh, gauges to a unified gauge layout. And that's the big deal. So this has the unified gauge layout look. And... I love a 944. My dad had one for several years. I've posted pictures of that in the past. It was his was silver rather than guards red, but I love a 944. And this one doesn't seem that bad. 113,000 miles, which maybe it sounds like a lot, but not on a 1986 car. He says it's got new tires, new fuel pump, brakes, rotors, brake lines, uh, a fresh paint. I can't see that. I can't see that ad very close. Do they have nine four four in quotes? No, <laughs> like it's a, it's a, it's an eighty six Porsche nine four four. No, oh, in the uh, sorry, in the bottom, it, yes, in the description. In the, yes, I can't buy. I can't buy that car. <laughs> it's just a, it's a nine the four price. four. The fake hood scoop is it's, it's just a Porsche as, as hell. It's like yeah. you're buying that from Doctor Evil. It's a nine four four. It's got the it comes honestly. with a second set of wheels with tires. Hey. It's got, a, it's got the telephone dial rims like it's got. Yeah, it's the right color. It's cool. It's, it's cool. Manual. It's a, those are those are really, really cool cars. And not for nothing. I've been told I haven't ever done uh, done one, but I think you can turn them into um, decent little kind of like autocrossing cars, too. Uh, so oh, yeah. you can have yes. fun on a track. With you them, totally so. can. And it's one of the last few uh, still affordable Porsches, right? Like it's, exactly. It's eighty five hundred dollars. I bet you can Porsches negotiate you can buy with the guy. I I bet you could get this for maybe eight thousand, certainly eighty two fifty, and mm-hmm. that's that's cheap for a Porsche. And you could still have you could have a Porsche in your garage. So that's my love pick. Love no, I'm, I I I would love to trash that, but the only thing I can trash is the nine four four in quotes. That's 
<sighs> but the car is awesome. Um, I'll I'll jump okay. up next here if that's okay with yep. you, Seth. Just of because yeah, go for it. Go. Just just because once again, um, Bruce and I are sort of on a scary same wavelength. Oh, did you find a nine forty four too. I I didn't find a nine four four. A nine two four. But it does come from nineteen eighty six, oh, and okay. it is a wedge. Okay. Delorean. Three hundred ZX. Eighty six Nissan three hundred ZX yes! Turbo. 135,000 miles, clean title in hand, ready to go, super rare, runs, drives perfectly, absolute blast to drive. Come oh, on. it's got the digital tack. Turbo, manual, digital tack. It, the body, lo- the paint looks like it might be just a little dull and it's black. I'm not a big fan of black. Be, how much is it again? $8,600 and it's in Naperville, oh, Illinois. You it's, need to own that. I, I know that's a day trip for me because I've driven I've driven to uh to Illinois before in in one day from here and that's the dangerous part, folks, about doing these cheap car challenges is sometimes we like <laughs> sometimes we we have a crisis because it's Transmission like transmission shifts like butter. Wow. I love it. <laughs> which which means it's gonna need a clutch. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's just got. Uh, it's got everything that I would want save for the black. I've, I've never been a huge fan of black. It looks really good when it's clean, uh, but it's I so know. difficult to keep clean. But, it, but uh, I mean, there's just dash like mm, yeah. now I found I found several um, of these Z31s around the country well under ten thousand dollars um but they're also i also found quite a few that are over so i think these cars are getting pretty close to the point where they're they're going to start clicking up in value um this one stood out because it was the turbo manual but i found some non-turbos with with the louvers on the rear windows and it's just like oh yes that's that's just it see i found c4 corvettes all day all night for under 10k autos Right? No, several really? of them were ma- no, no, oh. several of them were manuals. I, I would take this over a C4 though. Agreed, but it's just the fact that it's that wedge shape look, and you can have if you if you want to be a Corvette owner, a C4. Those are cheap. I mean, I'm getting. To, I have a. I have some gray hair now, but I don't have enough to get a Corvette yet. So I got to <laughs> stick with, with the Z. Um, hey. And another another aspect of the Z31, it's got the pop up headlights, but yeah. they were so smart they knew that eventually those those headlights would fail at some point. So even when they're down, they still have some functionality. You can you can still get a little bit of light from them. Hey Matt, I tweeted at you on New Year's Eve, and you were saying I want a Z31 or what was the other one? What's your other car that you wanted? The Z31 a, a or what? A Thunder, a 88 Thunderbird Turbo Coupe. No apologies, That's right. Seth. <laughs> That's right. And I told you, you should get a Z31 and that, yeah, you should just buy it. Yeah, oh, turbo. It's a lot of rattle can. That turbo should not be red. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's got the, uh, the it's got Do the. Do not uh, buy this uh, car. It, it's, it's got the eBay, uh, it's got the eBay air filter up front. It does. Yeah. No, hey, hey, but hey, it's it's under the budget. Um, yeah, I, I just noticed that's that's definitely not the factory steering wheel. No, that's no, like a that's Momo a fake wheel. Momo. <laughs> yeah, fake yeah. Momo. It's a FOMO. <laughs> but but look at that digital dash. I mean, like you said, Bruce, that's uh, it's got the the equalizer stereo with enough buttons to launch a space oh, does it have shuttle. A visual equalizer. I didn't notice that. Smith, Give me that shot. Stop, stop on the interior and and just like lean into the screen. You can smell exactly what that car is going to smell like when you get it. <laughs> I know, right? And it's like wet dog and old French fries. Like, <laughs> well, it was either this or a nineteen sixty one Cadillac for seventy five hundred bucks. Ooh, Four boy. door with the fins. I mean, it's, it runs and drives. Not perfect, barely. But, I bet. But but <laughs> two tone that sucker, put some wheels on it, and that's just that's the, an awesome ride. Wing cars from the fifties and sixties was going to be another one of my choices. Okay, Seth. All right, Seth, right. your turn. I I dropped a link. I don't know if I know how to actually share my screen so that all the lovely people at home can see it. Is that nope? I got it. I'll take care of you, bud. Okay, thank you. So, Ooh, an XJR. Right, so, so here's what here's what I'm doing. What? Right? Here's what I'm doing. I'm taking the era that I that that won for me, the 2000s, but a design that's straight out of the 60s, right? So yeah, this is, 
this is the this is the what generation? And under that? ten grand. Yeah. Under ten grand, it's like twenty bucks under ten grand. I wouldn't pay a, a dollar over seventy five hundred for this car. I haven't gone through this exercise a little bit before, but um, this is the X three fifty generation of of Jaguar XJR. This car is super cool, right? This is when they they basically made the entire car aluminum. The the entire totally. frame and, and skin of the car is built out of alum or uh, made out of aluminum. So in theory, like you don't really have any rust issues. Although you can still have some like weird aluminum corrosion issues, from what I'm told. Tons of power. I don't I don't know what the R was like. Uh, I, I'm trying to look it up quickly, but I think it was 400 the, horsepower, like or or at least pushing 400. I was thinking 350, but yeah. Okay. Well, the R also stands for repair. <laughs> yes yes we're getting to that uh but but it's you know again like i'm a large man i this is this is although it's a huge car at, with a uh small cabin relative to the exterior footprint of it there's still kind of enough room for me and like my various and sundry children and stuff that i need to put into it um it looks amazing it's got amazing wheels they sound fantastic uh you know it's it's sort of effortless to drive really fast and it has for anybody that ever was in a lot of new cars like in the early part of the 2000s too it's got all that tech that feels just like perfectly antiquated now like the original <laughs> in-car navigation systems yep. um, killer sound systems really really great leather seats uh the interior is really like just a splendid place to to uh, spend time in a car so i was wrong i just looked it up 395 not 350 so i thought it, I thought it was close to 400 you could probably breathe on it and do something stupid and make it you probably uh, could yeah you could probably yeah. breathe on it and get 400 but 395 it, uh, it's supercharged right like just just like a, a big sort of woofly v8 uh four four point two liter v8 um so these are really cool, but Smith, you're not wrong. Like I, I was, I was just a whisker away from buying one of these uh, when I ended up buying my uh, Mercedes that I have right now. And the car, it was, I don't even remember what he was asking, but it was something, it was under 10 grand or close to 10 grand. I brought it in for a pre-purchase inspection at the one place in Ann Arbor, which is a decent sized town that will yeah. actually work on something like this. Oh. And um, the guy was like, it's you know easy ten or twelve thousand dollars worth of work that I need to do on it, and the car felt like it felt great. So uh, they're a money pit if you like me are not going to work on the air suspension and the you know the supercharged engine and all of the electronic gremlins yourself. So that's that's one thing that I told myself because I'm a fan. I, I would love to hate on that car, but I can't because I'm a fan yeah. of of that area yeah. Jag. I'm it's a fan, easy. you know, going going even older like with with the uh, with the uh, the XJ12s. Um, if I were to have one of those, the only way I could do it would be, okay, I need a shop. I need my own workshop to work on it because there's no way I, I just on principle, I wouldn't want to spend $20,000 to repair it. I would have to no. work on it. I would have to work on it myself. Yeah. And I mean, I, I taught myself to work on old shows. I can handle fig figuring out a jag at some point. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that would be the prerequisite. If I'm going to get one of those, I'm going to have to have a place to work on it myself. And it's going to be like your typical Corvair owner. You're not going to have one. You're going to have like two or three because you, you'll have you'll have one. You'll have one that's running pretty good. You'll have one that you're working on and you'll have one that you're yanking parts off of. Well, I'll scare you off even more because the example that I was very close to buying was owned by a British gentleman who was the head head or or running the shop of uh again in town in ann arbor there's a lotus engineering facility yeah right they do, yeah, they yeah, do yeah. all there's kinds of engineering sense. for like big diesel engines and you know they, they they do engineering projects for anybody who who comes through essentially he and his team there at lotus engineering were the ones who had like been working on this car and kind of got it back up to what they thought was an incredibly high level of of service and specification and and then we just found all of these crazy problems that they didn't even see so i would say make sure that your garage is really well stocked <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um but yeah, no, it's they're beautiful. It's it's a car that would be fun to own for a little while if you just don't have to worry about it running every day. So, Bruce, what was uh one of our earlier podcasts where we did a, a cheap car challenge? The car that we oh, wouldn't buy for ourselves that you would we force would want, a friend to buy so that you could <laughs> so drive. so you could drive it. And yeah, and I think yeah. we both picked Jags on that one. Yeah, we did. Yeah, it's a good so, call. Good so we're, we're wrapping this up, but super real quick. I had another car prepared and someone just mentioned Corvair. And so I got to throw this out here. 
Corvair, less than 10 grand. It's a green briar, which means it's the van. So it's essentially you look like Scooby Doo driving around. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I picked an 86 car. You picked an 86 car. I picked a 60 or no, my, my Cadillac was 62, wasn't it? Yeah, this is 61. 61. Anyway. Close. Uh, this is this is freaky. We got to basically look like Scooby Doo, but it exists. It's less than 10 grand and it's out there. And but it's a Corvair. One. So you're going to have to buy another one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, I love it. I love it. Good so, choices. Yeah, I think that's our show for tonight. I think um, we have to wrap it up, Seth. Um, You've been back at Motor One here for what, a little over a month, month and a half now, Three thereabouts. Weeks, month, yeah, month yeah, a couple, couple months. It's time. Times. I'm having so much fun. It's hard to even try, keep track of time. <laughs> it's right? it's extreme. Well, we appreciate it's extremely you coming busy. on as a guest. You are Absolutely. always, always welcome. If you got a free night, come on. We don't care. Well, thanks. We're, uh, we're happy where to can, talk. Where can ours. people? Where can people follow you at? Social. Oh, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at at, at Seth S E Y T H. I was an early adopter on Twitter. Uh, so I got uh, <laughs> locked down the one name uh, handle. Nice. Uh, where else? At in- uh, Instagram is is uh, first name last name. Again, when you spell your first name S E Y T H, it's really easy to to secure these. So uh, you just search uh, Seth Mirsma M I E R S M A, and you'll find me all over the place. I'm on t- Twitter more more often than not. Cool. And, and and Seth is now also putting up occasional articles on Motor One. Did just some nice slices of life. One of the best writers you're ever going to read. You want to follow his articles oh at motorone.com. Weekly, right? That's the goal or my mistake? I, I think that what we're probably going to settle into is kind of a bi-weekly schedule. Yeah, okay, right, 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 okay. writing a column, trying to trying to crank those out at least a couple per month and mm-hmm. just um, – yeah. Hey, you guys know this, right? Like we talk to so many interesting people. We see, we, we, we have all of these kind of conversations and experiences that don't fit neatly into what we're doing on motor one every day, right? That they don't, they, they're not a news story and maybe it's not part of a, of a review, but a lot like what we're talking about here, a lot of like the stuff that you guys talk about on the podcast, I find it really fascinating too. So what I want to do is just try and like have a little bit of an outlet to um, to have a conversation with our readers and the people who follow us on social media, uh, by way of, you know, sort of, uh, these, these conversation starters as columns. So mm-hmm. yeah, check them out. We're trying to, trying to do Wednesday every other week. Now that I'm saying it publicly, I'm probably going to have to be a little bit more committed to it, but <laughs> sorry, sorry um, about that. Yeah, no, 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 it's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. And it's something I'm, I'm excited to, to uh, carry on with. So, well, I'm kicking myself because it was like a month or so ago, you posted on Twitter. It's like, what's, what's a car experience that you no longer have these days. And yeah. I thought it was just Seth being Seth. And then you write an article, like, you know, was it a couple of weeks ago talking about technology Last and week, cars and, and, and how they're different. Um, such a great read. It's like, ah, I should have tweeted you about like the foot dimmer switch. <laughs> you should have, that I should have. Right. That tweet went crazy. Like that was that was something that we we should talk about that too. Like that was why yep. I had to kind of encapsulate some of it in a column, right? Because it was something where everybody has that experience. Everybody yep. is like, I remember doing this thing in a car where I were uh, when I was a kid, and especially if you have kids, I have two young kids now. You're like, but I know that my kids will never do that, right? They're never gonna ride in the way back in a sleeping bag uh, on the way home from Cedar Point, right? Like they're never gonna do. There's so many cool things like mm-hmm. uh, people talking about like. They're sitting in a bench seat, like in front of the truck while their parent was parent was shifting the gear lever between their legs because everybody was like packed in there, you know, and basically dangerous, stupid stuff that we don't do anymore because they <laughs> right. killed us. But, um, but, you know, nostalgia is, a, is, is an interesting thing that colors those memories and, and uh, doesn't doesn't care about statistical uh, death rates. <laughs> essentially. <laughs> so. Sure. so you want to follow Seth on Twitter. You can follow me at CH writing on Twitter. Chris, you're I'm at uh, Chris- I, yeah, I'm Chris Bruce, 1985. And hey, I just want to promote for next week's episode, we are going to have John Fry as our guest. If you look him up on Instagram, he is Fry, that is F-W, or I'm sorry, F-Y-R-E-W-E-R-K. Um, and he is a super talented rendering artist. If you saw on Motor One or wherever you saw it, um, the Honda HRV teaser, uh, uh, drawing images, the teaser images, he did those. And yeah. he is going to be our guest next week. So if you have any questions for him, please send them to us. But he's going to be the guest, and we are really looking forward to talking to him. If you look at his Instagram, he is just an insanely talented rendering artist. He doesn't just do cars. He does a lot of, like, um, if you're familiar with it, like Japanese mecha-type stuff as well. Whoa. He's just 
he's I have, great. I have no idea what these Japanese robots are. <laughs> you, yeah, I, uh, Smith. That is that is else. not Voltron behind me, by the way. I, that's just that's just another trophy. Is a trick of the camera. No, we're <laughs> yeah. super he's stoked just, about that. Yeah, he's um, going to be our guest next week. So if you have any questions for him, please send them to us. Podcast at motor com, the post at motor com, or um, the YouTube uh, motor one podcast, depending on just whatever your preference is to comment to us. Let us know, because I am super looking forward to talking to this guy. I only discovered him like 10 ish months ago because he was putting out some cool renderings and then. Yeah, contacted him and he was like, Yeah, I'll talk to you guys for an episode. So sweet. We're looking cool. forward to it. Can't wait. Excited. Yeah. So a- as always, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. We appreciate every comment, every share, every follow, every subscription, every whatever you call it on whatever uh, on whatever service you're on. We love it. Um, and thank you very much. And I hope you have a good night. Bye bye. We'll see you later. Bye bye. Bye guys. <laughs>